By the middle of the 19th century, English art, like the art of most nations of that period, was looking rather old and tired. And as often happens at such moments, a group of young painters, very young painters in this case, got together and determined to do something about it. They called themselves the Pre-Raphaelites. The main trio were still art students. Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Holman Hunt, and the youngest and most precocious of the three, John Everett Millet. Very few English painters have produced so many unforgettable pictures so early, well before he was 30. And this is the most famous of them, Ophelia, painted in 1851. Shakespeare was a favorite source for 19th century artists. And as a young man with a taste for romantic melancholy, Millet was not surprisingly drawn towards the death of Ophelia described so beautifully in the fourth act of Hamlet. There is a willow grows aslant a brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Millet has it virtually word for word, or rather image for word. The willow with nettles entangled, the reflecting stream, the crow flowers, water crowfoot, the long purples, purple loosestrife, and he's added wild roses, perhaps because her brother Laertes called her the Rose of May. Also a robin, which she sings of earlier in the play. And her fantastic garland includes poppies that symbolize death, towards which she floats, singing as though in joy, her arms outstretched as if waiting to embrace the one she loves. At one point, Millet added daffodils to get some yellow into the picture, but the poet Tennyson persuaded him to paint them out for botanical reasons. Also a rat, which he likewise painted out because it looked like a lion. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood had been founded three years earlier in 1848. And this is the first picture Millet painted as a member of it. He was 19 and he chose Keats's poem Isabella about doomed love. The idea of the Brotherhood was to emulate the values in Italian art before Raphael, values of sincerity and truth to nature. With Raphael, so the artist felt, a rot had set in. But Raphael was the god of art in the 19th century, so they kept the name of the Brotherhood secret. They signed their pictures PRB which provoked curiosity and some not very funny jokes. Did the initials stand for please ring bell? And so on. The next picture Millet exhibited, which is here in the Tate, demonstrated more strongly the Pre-Raphaelite belief in truthfulness and in meaning. He painted Christ in the house of his parents, positively laden with symbolism. The young Christ has cut himself on a nail. A drop of blood has fallen on his foot. His mother is already the grieving virgin. The painting fell foul of the critics, not because of these rather coy illusions, but because the picture was too truthful to life. Joseph with bare feet and dirty fingernails, the clothes of poverty, muck on the floor, it was outrageous. 
Raphael would have cleaned it all up. Millet took care not to offend public opinion again. He was too ambitious for that. But this truthfulness to the real world remained. Just before Ophelia, he returned to the theme of tragic love with Mariana from Tennyson's poem. She only said, my life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a weary, a weary, I would that I were dead. The sensuality of Mariana far exceeds Tennyson, and it's enhanced by this intense blue. Here's pre-Raphaelite colouring at its most splendid and dazzling. They achieved this bright sparkle by applying pure colours to a white background that was still wet, painting it area by area like an early Italian fresco. So too the brilliant greens and bright flowers of Ophelia. But so also, of course, the immense time it took Millet to paint it. It took him weeks and weeks by the banks of a stream near Ewell in Surrey, painting for 11 hours at a stretch. He wrote wearily about bulls in the field and a pair of swans who churned up the water weeds just as he was painting them. The figure of Ophelia gave him further problems. The model was Elizabeth Siddle, later to marry Rossetti. Millet painted her not in the stream, but in a bath in his studio the following winter, keeping the water warm with lamps underneath that were never hot enough, and poor Miss Siddle was ill for weeks. More surprising is how Millet managed to unite the summer stream and the winter bath convincingly in one picture. Millet was to pursue this rich vein of melancholy for several more years. In 1856, he painted The Blind Girl, and once again, the poetry of sadness is sharpened by this brilliance of colouring. And by a minute attention to natural detail. In the same year, Millet painted another mood picture, Autumn Leaves. The end of the day, the end of summer. The wistful expressions of children as if lamenting the end of childhood and the departure of sweet innocence. But the artist himself was growing away from these youthful visions as he told the wife of a patron, people had better buy my pictures now when I'm working for fame than a few years later when I shall be working for a wife and children. Photographs record the change in Millet. He grew wealthy, famous, sought after by society, and in 1885, the first British artist to be made a baronet. His later fame rested on pictures that tugged the Victorian heartstrings as well as their purse strings. Like bubbles, bought by pears, the soap manufacturers, and used as an advertisement. Millet was furious, but it was poetic justice. Pears had only applied the same commercial principle that had guided the artist's own later career. So in the end, a note of lament in the young Millet's work becomes our lament for the passing of so great a talent. And yet, when all said, Millet gave us more in those first ten years than many an artist in a whole lifetime of sincerity. After the First World War, English painting turned its back on Europe and went its own rather peculiar way. The modern movement had struck England late only to bounce off again. The artist who flourished most conspicuously from this insular outlook was one of the strangest figures in all English painting, Stanley Spencer. Heaven knows what posterity will eventually make of this enormous canvas. 18 feet long. At present, it occupies an uncertain position in the Tate Gallery, 
ill-lit above a staircase and impossible to stand back from. It's an oddity, no doubt about it. And yet, if Spencer's reputation survives, this picture may be hailed as his masterpiece. The subject is the resurrection. Spencer began it in 1924, and it took him three years to complete. The setting is a churchyard, inspired by one of the sermons of John Donne, in which he describes a churchyard as the holy suburb of heaven. So it's on earth, yet witness to heavenly events. It's actually the churchyard in the village where Spencer lived all his life, Cookham, some 30 miles upriver from London. And here's the river, the Thames. It's become the river of life across which souls are transported, with an echo, perhaps, of the Styx in Greek mythology over which the dead were carried to Hades. In this case, in a Thames pleasure boat. So it's not the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of humankind. A benign last judgment, with just a handful of baddies, more naughty than damned, being roughed up in their open tombs. For the rest, it's a joyful occasion. Beneath the roses around the porch leans God the Father, and below him a rather feminine-looking Christ with children in his arms. On stone seats along the church wall sit Old Testament prophets, including Moses with the tablets of the law. Other reborn souls rise out of the flowers growing on their graves. They read their funeral notices to one another like village gossips. Or they study their own epitaphs, fascinated to see what their loved ones chose to say about them. Or else they just lounge about, happy to enjoy the sun again. A group of them are black in a dried up mud bath meant to suggest their tropical climate. Spencer, in fact, subtitled the picture an allegory of the saving of the black and white races. The most relaxed of all the souls is Stanley Spencer himself, taking a nap between two graves. And he appears a second time, naked behind a discreet cypress tree. Spencer's first wife, Hilda, appears no fewer than three times, lying on an ivy-covered tomb in the centre foreground, sniffing a sunflower, and clambering onto the deck of a riverboat. There's another personal touch nearby. A woman is brushing a man's jacket just as Spencer's mother used to do each morning when her husband, a builder, went to work. Spencer said that what he liked was taking solid lumps of my own life and putting it on canvas. I like my life so much, he said, that I would like to cover every empty space on a wall with it. His father used to read the Bible in the evenings to his large family. As a result, somehow, Spencer wrote later, religion was something to do with me, and I was to do with religion. It came into my vision quite naturally, like the sky and rain. Spencer was like a hermit, bedded away from his own time, and from the art of his own time. He was cushioned by English provincialism, but he was also sustained by it. Cookham gave him all he wanted. Paris and Berlin would not have done that.
In 1914, he had begun this picture of swans being caught for marking, at Cookham, naturally. Then the war broke out. Spencer was sent with an ambulance unit to Macedonia. Four years later, he returned to Cookham and went on with the picture as if nothing had happened. The next year, 1920, he painted Christ carrying the cross. Again, it's Cookham, the house where Spencer was born. He used to watch builders' men walking past the house carrying ladders, and the scene became the road to Calvary. private stage on which great events are enacted, like St. Francis and the Birds in the setting of a Cookham farmyard. The saint, he explained, painted as a memory of his father, whose trousers got stolen one day, so that he went about the village for a while in his dressing gown. He had the kind of imagination, Spencer, of medieval sculptors who would carve grotesque corbels and misery cords for the local church. All his life, private obsessions were the fountain of Spencer's art, and these included sexual obsessions, like this extraordinary double portrait of himself and his second wife, Patricia, who was a lesbian and with whom he never lived, accompanied by a leg of mutton. Well, England between the wars was unprepared for such frankness about sex and meat, though this picture too has now found its way to the Spencer room at the Tate. But then nearly all Spencer's work is about bodies. His resurrection is the resurrection of the flesh those solid lumps of his own life put down on canvas, as he described his work. There's a primitive flavor about this huge painting, which is more than the simplicity of the artist's own faith. It lies in the constant reminiscence of the kind of painting Spencer loved most, the great fresco cycles of the Italian so-called primitives, Giotto above all which of course he never saw except in books. But here, in these tilted perspectives and puppet-like narrative, is Spencer's bid to rekindle the spirit of the earliest Christian art, when visions, as he believed, could still live in harmony with the real world. <laughs> an enormous sun about to sink behind the Dorset Hills. In the foreground, strange spheres inhabit the fields as though they were the sun's satellites. But it's a mirror. A hawk gazes at its own reflection. Another sphere lies at our feet. A mirror, and next to it, a transparent screen. So with the aid of two surfaces, we are looking at a landscape two ways, behind us and in front. And shadows are falling two ways. There are two kinds of sky, red and blue. And another hawk is in flight somewhere above and behind us. The artist was Paul Nash. He called this landscape from a dream. And it's no surprise that the year he began it was the year when the first major exhibition of surrealist painting was shown in London, 1936. Dreams, the shock of incongruity. Objects awarded unexpected meaning through surprise associations. Such things were the grammar of surrealism, especially for the painter Nash was most taken with, the Belgian René Magritte. There are several Magritte-like touches here. The mirror itself and the games that can be played with it. The fact that the hawk is reflected in the mirror, but the framework of the screen is not. Realistic clouds are placed next to artificial ones.
And how big is the mirror? In relation to the hawk, you might think it fairly small. How big is a hawk? But the mirror casts a shadow as far as the distant hills. The surrealism of Paul Nash never submerges a love of real landscape. This is very clearly the Dorset coast, where the hills come down to form promontories between rocky bays, and the sea is silver under heavy cumulus clouds. It's evening. The sunset tells us that. The sun, huge on the horizon. Shadows are long. The grass is golden in late summer. And the spheres? They're actually round bales of hay or corn. Nash had seen them in a film on the American prairies and imported them into his picture. The hawks imported too from an ancient Egyptian carving. I turn to landscape, Nash wrote, not for the landscape's sake, but for the things behind. The roots of his art lay in a romantic and very English view of landscape that you find in the paintings of Samuel Palmer, in the poetry of Wordsworth, and the novels of Thomas Hardy. A landscape is full of presences, of symbolic meanings, powers we don't understand, powers over us. Through strange correspondences between natural and man-made images, Nash sought to pinpoint the emotional intensity we sometimes feel in the landscape about us. Nash took a photograph of the motif and how banal it looks. But Nash saw it differently. He cut out the buildings, he raised the trees in line, made it twilight, always good for magic, and added a moon to converse, so to speak, with the classical pillar. With Nash, images always mean more than they literally represent. In an early drawing in the Tate Gallery, Nash set the pyramids half engulfed by giant waves under a partial eclipse of the moon. The moon's power over the tides threatens some of the oldest and most permanent constructions of man. Five years later, 1917, a cherry orchard in Gloucestershire is bare of leaves and life and protected by barbed wire so that it becomes an echo of the landscape of the trenches where Nash had been fighting as an infantryman. In the 20s and early 30s, his work took a new turn. That love of mysterious presences steered him towards the art of the Italian painter De Chirico, whose work was shown in London in 1928, the year before Nash painted this picture, Blue House on the Shore. The most ordinary of buildings is given a touch of the sinister by an emphatic shadow and the dead black interior. In the same year, one of his most arresting landscapes, it's a view from the rear of the cottage in Sussex where the artist now lived. Again, objects are awarded an eerie life of their own. A simple basket called a Sussex trug. Just a post and a wicker fence. A pile of logs with an orchard beyond. All of them made to look artificial by the accompaniment of this tall screen, which doesn't seem to belong at all. A few years later, mid-thirties, and it's the mystery of reflections that begins to catch his imagination. A hotel dining room which had mirrors on facing walls and globe lights from the ceiling becomes a dream labyrinth called Voyages of the Moon. Very soon, events were to land a new subject virtually on Nash's doorstep. When the Second World War broke out, he moved to Oxford. And there, outside the city, he went to photograph a dump of German aircraft shot down during the Battle of Britain. 
These torn and twisted shapes were ready-made for Nash's imagination. Neither de Chirico nor Magritte ever had images quite like these to play with. And Nash responded with the painting he entitled Totus Mir, Dead Sea. Along with Henry Moore's shelter drawings, this is the most memorable British work of art to come out of the Second World War. A graveyard of German aircraft under the eye of the moon. Those favorite twilight colors of Nash and that pervading sense of mystery. The thing looked to me suddenly like a great inundating sea, he wrote. You might feel this is a vast tide moving across the fields, the breakers rearing up and crashing on the plain. The only living creature is another favorite image, a bird in flight, an owl hunting for mice. They haunt the mind, these recurring images. Birds, clouds, sun and moon, seas, mirrors, screens, shadows, ambiguous forms. So many elements in his other paintings come together in landscape from a dream. And like images in a dream, they ask to be interpreted. And in the interpretation,